Um, so another thing that needs to be taken in mind is the fact that it is part of the game. Uh, you know, it's, I mean, quests, it's funny that I haven't given like talk in the course on quests. Kind of like, <coughs> realizing they're kind of important. They are, they kind of build the whole structure of the game. They're like the cells that build the whole game. Um, if you remember the screen I showed at the start of the process where you're drawing bubbles on the whiteboard? The game often is just the structure of quests that the player moves through. So they kind of bookend everything. But nonetheless, within quests, between them, when you get the, the mission and when you complete it, there's a lot of gameplay. You know, game systems are involved. A lot of you know, potentially open-ended interactions the player goes through. So you know, see this diagram here. The content you're delivering the player might be these little pieces that are coming together in a nice linear progression. Uh, but the player's off on the side doing all kinds of crazy stuff in between. So when you write these pieces of content, they have to mesh really nicely with the, the game that has been designed and, and the actual goals of the, of the mission that has been created. Uh, an example that comes to mind when I think about this is always the first Max Payne, where literally every mission objective ends with, I don't know who was in the building, I couldn't trust anybody, I had to kill them all, you know? Because that's the main mechanic of the game, you just run through levels and shoot everybody. So it kind of constrained the type of you know missions you could be given, the kind of writing you could have, the type of character you could have. Um, if you have a very narrow game, you know, it, it can make it problematic for a like, really you know, varied and, and interesting story. Um, so for this, this uh, challenge, I keep calling it a challenge, this bounty, you can obviously think of whatever game you want, you can think of a much broader set of, set of tools, but um, this, this is another one of those constraints on the type of missions you can come up with. Uh, you know, they have to be bound up with the game they're working on. Um, so then, you know, open this up to a bunch of text, a bunch of text on slides, but agency is obviously a very complicated element to take into account. Um, I'm again even thinking, um, even though these first couple are not even really uh, expecting there to be choices in the game, but if you have, you know, there's always this tension between storytelling <coughs> and player freedom. Um, I'm sure you guys have touched on this in other contexts, but you know, if you give the player a choice to go anywhere in the world, do anything in any order, be anybody they want, then it's very hard to have a, an actual storyline, an actual dramatic progression, uh, unless you generate tons of content for every possibility. So there's usually some effort of the writer to tell a story, you know, you get up to a certain point and the city burns down, or maybe one of two big things happen, but this, the writer wants something to happen. So if you have to do that, and you're going to take away some agency, it's just kind of a delicate uh, process. So, so imagine like you're going to, you need an ambush to happen, because it's important to the story. Player needs to be captured or something like that. You know, players are going to, if they, they're, they're going to feel pushed into it if it's a, this is what you call a forced failure. One trick you can use is letting the player character at least express doubts about what's about to happen. They could be saying, hey, I don't think we should go in there. We're going to, you know, it's swarming with enemies. We'll get, we'll get surrounded and then have them be overruled by somebody in the world. Uh, at least letting the player character express doubts about something you need to happen will you know, soften the blow, I think, of forcing the, some story on the player. Um, another way to um, you know, give the player some control over like a, what you would call like a story, story content or linear progression is letting them express their own opinions about it. So maybe they're forced to go through with an assassination or something like that. Um, and you know, as a game designer, you don't want to force this attitude on the player of being a ruthless killer. You can at least let them, when they get back to base, have a top three choice and say, you know, I really don't think we should have gone through with it, or something like that. And then the player, they, they've had to live this experience, but at least you've given them some ownership over the, the, the emotional tone of it. Um, so two ways you can kind of soften the blow, you know, being a writer and trying to tell a specific story. Um, so a couple of these are just kind of tips and tricks. Kind of detail but you know, if you get into writing one of these quests and you have, want to give the player some choice in terms of what they do, I just recommend only giving them one way to make a choice. Oftentimes you'll have a, a, game, a quest structure where you're, you're, you're allowed to say, yes, I'll do that for you, or no, I forget it, I'm not going to do it. And then you may still be able to go in the world and save the person's cat or whatever. And then you've got two ways of deciding to help the person or not. And my suggestion is either make it a strict system where you either take the quest and you can do it or not or make it a situation where the player maybe has a non-committal response uh, and then they decide just by playing the game. If they do go rescue the cat, then they come back and they've done this quest. Um, just keep your life simple. Have like one, one state you're, you're managing. Um, have a tweaky 
uh, piece of recommendation. If you haven't wrestled with variables and stuff yet, then uh, kind of an aside, but I think it's important to keep keep a number of variables uh, minimal. And um, and essentially, that's that's most of it. I mean, agency is obviously about choice and consequence. And if you're going to put a choice in front of the player, you want that to have some effect. Um, I've, you know, many years coming from an action adventure background, I've shied away from any kind of top three choices that aren't momentous. You know, like give me the give me this weapon or you know betraying one of your comrades. You know, something big that gives you to stop the game and bring up a menu of text. Um, but if you do do a lot of top tree type stuff, and I've come to soften to it in, in, over the years. Um, it, it is useful for capturing what the player's attitude is toward the game and like, building up who the character might be. You know, make sure that you're tracking it somehow. And it may be that you make three rude uh, comments to a character, and before that character gets mad at you, you know, so maybe maybe you're actually kind of upping, you know, doing a plus one or plus two on some metric in the background. But you know, make sure that the game is caring the, the, what the player's saying and and then eventually feeding it back to them. And that, I think, you know, makes you know, these quest-based interactions a little more, um, you know, a little stronger for the, for the player in terms of them owning the experience. So, so that's kind of a whirlwind tour of all the things I think that are hard about writing quests and picking the right kind of quest idea. Any questions or thoughts, anything I might have missed before I continue on? I guess I've talked a lot about games already, a good sense of what a quest is, but it's good to kind of, you know, step through all the aspects of them deliberately once in a while. So for nonlinearity, um, what do I want to say about this? It's a potentially huge topic. Um, the ideal of, of a nonlinear system, I think, you know, a fantasy, eh, potentially realizable fantasy, but is this notion that maybe you could make a game where uh, the game kind of understood the player by the way the player played, uh, the things the player did, and could present content suitable for that player. It's kind of a Will Wright uh, speech he often gives, where you know, he says, you know, the game should know if you're a collector, if you're always collecting or mining or something, you should figure that out and start giving you missions and, and obstacles that are suitable to that. And, and, and you know, Presumably in a dramatic structure that makes sense. You know, have some sense that well, this player we let him have some success now accumulating gold. We need to have the pirates raid his base or something. We need to have X or Y or Z happen to give the kind of right shape to the drama. Um, so there's this kind of nebulous notion of a game being smart enough to you know, figure out who you are, how you're playing, and then what elements to throw at you and assemble to create this kind of dramatic experience. Um, and it's not often discussed how you might actually make that happen. And I think that there are some mundane ways you can go about achieving something very similar to that. Um, and I'll present a really kind of basic possibility here. And this is just the notion of what if you, again, just have a linear experience through a game, come with some quest ideas, and you just vary pieces of the quest. Um, you know, in this, this writing course, we talk about um, Vladimir Prop in his analysis of the Russian folk tale, where he basically takes all the Russian folktales and boils them down to this set of dramatic structures, which he can define with formulas, so these little symbols. You can see this, these symbols, <coughs> the M and the, the arrow, are actual morphemes from his system, where for a quest, you know, the hero learns of some really difficult challenge and then has to travel somewhere to, to do it, right? Pretty basic stuff, kind of aligns pretty well with how things happen in games. And, you know, I think in a very basic way, if you just varied up those bullets, you know, instead of thinking of a quest like an MMO where you have a team writing quests for the wizard, and the wizard gets 450 quests of this kind, and this other class gets 450 quests of a different kind, um, you, know, you could make the variation more on the pieces of the quest level, where, say, for this example here, learning of the quest, you may know some, some players may like to be roaming the environment. Like in Skyrim and just exploring the woods and stuff like that. So maybe you put something out in the woods that a character can discover to start on the path of this quest. Uh, another character might be into working for the authorities and being a well-paid mercenary. So you put another starting point for the quest there and kind of the, the structure of a mission the king might give. And, and so on and so forth. You just add some variety to that beat of the quest. And then, of course, traveling to the place, pretty common in games to have multiple paths through a level. That would be another area where you could vary based on what kind of character it is, um, how they might want to play the game. 
And you can just so you can imagine building out like you know five or six beats of some pretty well structured dramatic quest, but supporting different play styles, different character classes, um, and in that way making the adventure or the quest the player's own. And again, kind of a mundane way, but I think a way that would feel pretty natural to players. Players can't really parse that many variables and that much nuance. Um, so I've come to think this this approach might not, you know, might actually yield some fruit. Uh, if you want to build something a little more fluid. Um, there's a digression I could go into. I don't really think we're this. There are systems that in class I'll, I'll show uh, first order logic from AI researchers who define something like betrayal. And it shows all the mathematical, logical pieces of what a uh, character betrayal looks like. And it's pretty subtle if you think about trying to define something like that. You have to have a character who needs something, wants something. And you have to have a second character who knows that they want that thing. Um, and, and then that second character has to you know, take an action to stop them. And there's a few other real subtleties about uh, I wish I could remember a couple more, but it, it's basically you have to have a character who knows a thought in another character's head, essentially, and then you'll take an action against it. So they'll define this, this whole structure, and then with the structure in place, they'll go into a system and say, okay, we want to have a betrayal happen now. Who knows this character, and also knows something that they want, and also has a way to stop them from doing it? And you know, basically should do a big database search to find these pieces and put them together. Um, and it's pretty much exactly this. It's just kind of buckets, you know, little places with requests that can vary, and they just kind of fill them in with you know, whatever can be found in the environment. Um, so that's the fancy version of this. I don't think anybody will take it that far, but I want to say a few words just about you know what, how quests could be taken a little further than where they are in, in most games these days. And I think there's quite a bit of uh, space to maneuver just in this, this notion of just filling in the blanks, doing like a mad lib essentially of, of, of a quest for 